So what uh, my interest has been the same for uh, almost 40 years, and as essentially to study cancer genetics, in particular try to dissect uh, the genetic and biological elements that lead to one particular cancer, which is uh, uh, cancer derived from B lymphocytes. So the, I think it's particularly evident from studying this cancer that a lot of the events that are going on in generating the full phenotype are dependent on the normal biology of the tissue target. That's particularly evident in the highly specialized B cells. So what I'll do in the talk is provide you some uh, background uh, uh, for non-immunology, uh, non-B cell biologists about the very peculiar biology of uh, B cells, in particular this germinal center B cells, then give an overview of the main genetic alterations that I think uh, are involved in generating a B cell lymphoma, uh, what happens to uh, the several pathways uh, in B cells and how they are altered based on genetic basis. And then in the final part of the talk, more dedicated to the expert in the field, there'll be some uh, uh, very recent and some even some new d unpublished data about uh, a particular pathways in B cells. Okay, so a as I mentioned, a lot of what I will be said is linked to the very peculiar biology of B cells, and in particular, a, a specialized uh, phase of a life of a B lymphocyte, which is called a germinal center. And actually, when I speak to an audience which is not uh, of immunologists, the, the part that they find more interesting is what, is, uh, what these germinal centers are, which I think are really fascinating in terms of biology. So, uh, so germinal center, what are B cells, you know what they, let me see. They are in, born in the bone marrow, like all blood cells, and uh, they come to the periphery uh, to lymphoid organs, spleens, lymph nodes, and so on, with, a, with an antibody on the surface because already done the first round of genomic changes uh, that lead to the production of diversified antibody molecules. They come there, they haven't seen the antigen yet, which is their job, and uh, the encounter with the antigen usually is a low affinity encounter, right, between the variable region of the antibody and the epitope of the antigen, and uh, simplifying a lot, a lot of, a lot of signals and structures, that encounter unleashes the germinal center reaction. Uh, and here where the peculiarity starts. So initially is a hyperproliferative phase. If you inject an antigen into a mouse in, uh, and you look at the spleen a week after you injected the antigen, you'll see the spleen full of microscopically visible, so a notable little masses of B cells that are the germinal, they are the germinal center. Uh, they're truly hyperproliferative because the doubling time is 10 to 12 hours, which is believed the fastest proliferation rate known for any mammalian cells. Very peculiar cell cycle, which, of which we don't know much because we cannot culture these cells in vitro. They are programmed to cell death within hours and they require the special environment. So nobody has been able to culture these cells. And uh, not only they proliferate uh, aggressively, but they also do something that no other cell in the body can do. They actively change their DNA with a mechanism called somatic hypermutation. It's an enzymatic driven mechanism that changes up to 5% of the basis in DNA in the variable region of immunoglobulin. As a result of this change in the variable region, the original affinity to the antigen will be either lost and the cells will receive no further sign signal for survival, they will die. Or, again, I'm simplifying a lot, the cells are re-challenged by the antigen and those with high affinity will receive a lot of survival signals that we will see in a second. And then they will march toward their final destiny to become memory cell or plasma cells, right? And before they do that, they do another unique uh, genome acrobatic. They break the DNA double strand and they substitute a constant region of immunoglobulin changing from IgM to IgG, IgE, IgA, antibody with different biological properties. So you can, as you can understand, I'm putting a lot of emphasis, but that's really what's unique and what is important for tumors in a second. In this changes in DNA that are unique to lymphocytes and unique particularly to germinal center B cells in the case of uh, somatic hypermutation. And so 
this introduction is sets a stage for what's coming in lymphomas because uh, there are more than 40 different types of uh, B-cell lymphomas. The pathologists have been very good at the microscope in identifying phenotypically and clinically distinct forms. But uh, around 80% of them is this follicular lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which will be the one we'll be talking about. And uh, we know that they derive from the germinal center because they have these irreversible markers of hypermutation immunoglobulin genes that are mostly clonal. So we know that the major expansion of the tumor comes from a cell which is transited through the germinal center and sometimes has gone out of the germinal center in further differentiation. As only mantle cell lymphoma is a pre-germinal center malignancy. And in the very complicated nomenclature of this tumor, acute leukemias are imma from immature cells where all lymphoma and also chronic lymphocytic leukemia and multiple myeloma are considered mature uh, B-lymphocyte uh, malignancies. So these changes in DNA do not uh, represent only markers that help us to look at the clonal origin, but they also are uh, a very sophisticated mechanism that uh, uh, have mistakes and chromosomal translocations, which are the hallmark of this disease, represent mistakes of any, either of um, any of these uh, three, three, three uh, mechanisms that generate abnormal recombination involving oncogene, as we will see. Now, uh, uh, a lot of the biology of the germinal center uh, has been uh, learned looking in particular to so-called master regulator transcription factors that regulate this uh, sophisticated environment. And uh, uh, we learn a lot through uh, looking at the biological program of this transcription factor. Actually, it's transcriptional repressor. So to what we see here, imagine this is a cell in the first phase of a germinal center, what they call centroblast or dark zone of the germinal center. And uh, this uh, gene is being cloned because it's genetically altered in lymphoma. But it's in normal function, dictates a lot of the biology of these uh, cells. It's a transcriptional repressor. And what you see here are uh, uh, pathways, programs in the cells that are modulated, repressed by BCL6. It's a zinc finger, BTP zinc finger transcription factor, binds DNA specifically to its consensus sequence, and represses based on chipset data around 400 genes, and uh, binds and they move uh, accordingly, they are repressed by BCL6. And what you see here are uh, representative examples of these uh, target genes with the function that they are related to. So the represses activation, which is a generic term for uh, you know, a B cell receiving a signal of metabolic and uh, response to various stimuli. Very important is, and this is really the peculiarity of germinal center, the repressive activity of molecules, genes involved in sensing and response to DNA damage. Uh, for instance, it represses in this phase P53. We interpret this with the need in this particular environment to have tolerance for DNA breaks because DNA breaks are physiologic in order to perform somatic permutation, class switch recombination, those uh, uh, genomic uh, reconfiguration that I alerted you. Uh, then it represses uh, cell cycle arrest gene, like P21, for reason that we don't understand represses the simic gene, which for some of you actually one of the prototype example of uh, proliferation markers, but in through these hyperproliferative cells is, is repressing MIC for reason that we don't understand. We take time to speculate on that. It represses BCL2 enforcing a pro-apoptotic uh, environment, which will be reverted later on, as we will see. And it represses only few indicated here a number of receptor, signal transducer, nuclear effector of uh, signals from the environment, uh, from cytokine and chemokines. It represses PRMD1, also known as BLIMP1, which is the master uh, regulator of plasma cell differentiation. No P BLIMP1 in mice, no plasma cell. So if you look at this collectively, to put it simple, what BCL6 is telling the cells in this first phase is uh, proliferate, don't bother to a certain extent about DNA damage, it's physiology. Don't listen to signal from the environment. You cannot differentiate or activate. Just proliferate and remember you are a B cell maintaining a certain chromatin config configuration. Then 
this would be the successful B cell, the one that sees the antigen high affinity as perform hypermutation. This high affinity receives a lot of signal, very simplified here from T cells, from you'll see from toll-like receptor and other enviro cytokines, chemokines. And uh, we'll see them in more detail in a second, but there, is, there are pathways, transcriptional or protranscriptional, at that point telling the cell the job is done, they turn off BCL6 and the cell becomes like any other cell, sensitive to DNA damage, ready to respond signals from the environment. And so one thing that I stress at this point, you may understand that uh, shutting off BCL6 is a critical moment, allowing the cells to differentiate and move out of this very useful, because that's how you make high affinity antibody, but gene genomically dangerous environment because of what's going on here. Hyperproliferation, mistakes, tolerance to DNA damage. And uh, as you will see, the tumors tend to prevent this event quite often. Now, we'll with this background, I'll now focus on a particular tumor. You, you can't, we can't talk about 40 different ones because they're all different biologically and genetically. So we focus through the years in the most frequent, uh, around 40% of all diagnosis on B-cell lymphoma. This is the most frequent hematologic malignancy in general. And uh, it's also made more frequent by the fact that the other common B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, late in his uh, clinical course, turns into this form and essentially is lethal for the patient. So the key word in these tumors is heterogeneity. The pathologists have been done a good work in differentiating many tumors, but in this case, they, they, could be, they were able only to give a single name to something that themselves and the clinician recognized for years as being more probably than one disease because of their especially uh, very distinct response to the same therapeutic regimen. Some patients are cured with the current uh, immunotherapy, uh, chemotherapeutic regimen, others are are not cured. And the heterogeneity was made uh, objective and then also genetically objective years ago by the pioneering work with gene expression profiling by Lou Stout's group that uh, defined essentially subset of these diseases, which are again simplified here, with two major subsets deriving from the germinal center, the so-called germinal center type tumors, which seems to derive a cell of origin from a cell that is moving from the first phase to the second phase of the one I just described, from a centroblast to a centrocyte, while the so-called activated B cell type, ABC type, seems to derive from a cell which is blocked in its attempt to differentiate to a plasma cell. And the important thing not shown in the slide, that to this, in response to the same uh, clinical therapeutic regimen, this has a slightly fav more favorable prognosis, and these are the worst, uh, they contain the worst cases. Now, the uh, job of um, my lab and several other labs through the years, starting from the uh, beginning of the cloning era in the early 80s, has been trying to, to, to define genetically tumors. Cancer is a genetic disease that must be altered genes. Let's find these altered genes. And for uh, till uh, five, six years ago, that was essentially based on looking at chromosome alteration that were recurrent or educated guesses based on the biology. And finding a single altered genes will make your success for quite years, will give you grants, and you will study that gene forever. And, uh, but the major question remained open for many years. Uh, you read in the textbook, uh, cancer is a genetic disease, but uh, multiple genes are altered based on the number of arguments. But mo multiple means, what, uh, two or three, 30, 300? And so all this came to an end when we could sequence uh, the exome and now the full genome of these uh, tumors, which is an effort that is going on worldwide, as, as, you, as you probably know. So a few years ago, when still was quite expensive, we could afford the early sequencing of the exome of the coding portion of the gene by whole uh, next generation sequencing. We look also at copy number variation, so amplification and deletions. And we try to put it in uh, validation and variety of context of the results of that. Uh, based on network analysis, validation in ample samples by, of course, a 
expression of the affected genes and all that. And usually when, when a, a next generation sequencing project is introduced and the results is commonly uh, uh, projected with this type of schemes, in what you see uh, uh, genes, na name of genes here, uh, ranked based on the, their frequency of specific alteration in, in a particular tumor from the most frequent to the least, uh, least frequent. And so a few considerations, uh, the, the good no news now in all the altered genes, the bad news is that around 100 uh, alteration average per case, so very complex. And when I made alteration mutation, I used the, the term in genetic, strictly genetic terms, so involved point mutation of different types, uh, copy number variation, amplification of deletion, with evidence of focality, so no more than three genes involved in the minimal common regions, so strong uh, uh, candidate genes, uh, and chromosomal translocations. So putting all that together is uh, around 100 average per case, and every case is uh, greatly different, so we have around several hundreds of genes uh, that uh, are making this, uh, this uh, picture, which is a moving target because the more uh, cases are sequenced, the more the tail um, becomes longer, and even genes that seems to be occasionally, if you have thousands of cases, they become recurrent. And in my career, I have seen very few, actually no case, of a gene that is specifically and recurrently altered in a tumor which has no biological significance. So my personal opinions, you may hear this definition of drivers and passengers mutations, there are clearly genes that are called drivers that are more important, but there are a lot of active passengers that complement the activity of the driver. So I'm not sure that you, can, uh, that you can really define what a passenger mutation gene is once you have strict definition of uh, recurrence, focality, and so forth. Okay, that's anyway, it's a long discussion. So uh, this is a very, you know, it's a lot of genes, what we do now. Uh, uh, certainly, you have to, un to learn what each gene does normally in germinal center cells and what happens when it's mutated. That's one thing that's pretty obvious and uh, one, uh, everybody will start from the most frequently mutated and you see here this is everyone is a project if you want, the normal function, uh, uh, abnormal function, modeling in mouse, putting into networks, see what they do. Uh, with other genes. The second effort is trying to reduce uh, this enormous space of mutation in a smaller space of pathways. So uh, many genes, smaller pathways. I'll show you later examples in which the same pathways can be altered by th 13 different gene mutations in different cases. So once you move uh, from the different way you can skin the cat or you can alter a pathway, you have a pathway instead of uh, of a, of a gene as a target, maybe in terms of understanding of biology and also if you want to therapeutically target it. So at this stage, if you want to put together this mess in something that is uh, conceptually at least preliminary understandable, we see a number of pathways that are altered in these tumors independent of subtype. So all diffuse large cell lymphoma very frequently have problems with uh, uh, regulator of chromatin modification, acetyltransferases and methyltransferases. This would be a seminar by itself, but just give you a few concepts. Uh, these are pleiotropic regulators of uh, transcription. They are uh, target histones. They target also specific transcription factor. In tumors, uh, they are usually loss of function mutation, uh, focal deletion or mutation that truncate the protein or inactivate the enzymatic activity. They usually Emizygous, so they are haploinsufficient tumor suppressor gene. If you mimic it in mice, you get uh, a lymphoid proliferation in tumors. There is good evidence that they have a tumorigenic effect because actually for this, for this genes, there is a familiar syndrome of uh, uh, loss of uh, one allele function that is a tumor predisposition syndrome. So we don't even need a mouse model. We have rare family in which either of these two genes is prone to tumors, it's called, and, and, uh, and, and so it, it is an haploinsufficient tumor suppressor. The important thing about these genes, uh, again, I have no time to go all that story, that they seem to be very early alteration in the 
cascade of events that leads to tumor, not only in lymphoma, but even in other, in other, tum in other tumor types. So it seems <coughs> that they, uh, less of dosage deranges the control and transcription in a way, and this is speculation, that is permissive to the uh, other, other alteration that follow. So the second and very important, and is a, by different mechanisms, is a, a deregulation of BCL6. BCL6 is the gene I talked at the beginning that needs to be shut off. There are multiple mechanisms that prevent the shut off or delay or deregulate the gene, and this is a, summarizes that. So, for instance, uh, uh, wait a for instance, there is a transcription factor called MEF2B. Uh, expressing other tissue, but it's also expressing germinal center cells, and it's mutated in 15% of cases. It directly targets the activation of BCL6 at the beginning of a germinal center, and these mutations that uh, we published and characterized actually are, have a, 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 a dominant effect on BCL6. They prevent uh, the shutoff of uh, MEF2B, and they enforce BCL6 expression at non-physiologic levels. The second set of alteration in a quarter of cases, chromosomal translocation prevents the shutoff of BCL6 by this cascade that we'll see later. And uh, this acetyltransferase defect that I just mentioned, actually uh, CBP or P300, specifically acetylate uh, uh, specific lysing on BCL6 protein, and that acetylation has an uh, inactivating effect on BCL6. So a defect in this gene also deregulate BCL6. It makes it more active. And the work of another Italian, Michele Pagano at NYU, showed that loss of function of this gene uh, is involved in stabilizing the BCL6 protein, prognosing the half-life, and it's a rare mutation, but acts at the level of protein. And among the many consequences of this, the modulation, continuous modulation of P53, and the maintenance of this uh, DNA damage tolerance environment, we think it's very important. We modeled in mice. If we make any of these events in mice, we see cells that accumulate DNA damage including specific chromosomal translocations. So the third very common alteration is escape from immunosurveillance. And of course, the, I expect some of, of your reaction will be, well, every tumor escape immunosurveillance, and this is an old problem, so there's a lot of progress now in understanding. This tumor do something very simple, something I expected to many tumors would do, but in fact that's not the case. But over 50% of this tumor do something very simple. They genetically inactivate the component of the HLA class 1 complex. So the HLA class complex is the one deputed to presenting mutated uh, antigen to the surface. And if you don't have HLA class 1, you read in the textbook, you don't have recognition by cytotoxic T cell. So these tumors are uh, knockout beta-2 microglobulin, which is necessary for the formation of a complex. More recently, we found that they also, in other cases, mutate HLA class 1 genes directly. So the result is the tumors is invisible, so cytotoxic T cells, and also from a lot of other data, invisible to natural killer cells also. So this is very uh, simple mechanism that uh, these tumors uh, uh, do. They have uh, uh, lots of mutant genes, so lots of mutant peptides, and so this is a very simple thing to escape immunos immunosurveillance. For those of you that have followed the explosion in uh, the checkpoint, immune checkpoint activation and the therapeutic targeted or immune checkpoint, so this tumor don't express PD-1 or PDL one they don't need to do to, to tell the T cell at bay because they are essentially invisible, but that's another complex story. But this is, this is important. There's a number of clinical implications for transplant and so forth. Then there are alterations that are more predominant uh, in the uh, GCB subtype of, uh, of these tumors. It's a very fragmented picture. We don't have uh, uh, a biology that seems to characterize, but certainly the ectopic expression, this uh, translocation make BCL2 mic escape the control of BCL6. So they have anti-apoptosis and the number of mic-related functions expressed in germinal center cells were usually they are suppressed. 
This is a chromatin modifier. There's a dominant mutation analogous in, ma in some ways to this. There is also a, 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 a drug targeting now this mutation. And this is a pathway identified by Jason Sister and Lou Stout is a pathway that uh, most frequent uh, mutation. To make it simple, this is a pathway that is deputed to the local constraint of a germinal center B cell within the germinal center mass. When this pathway is activated by mutation, cells spread, they go to peripheral blood and to bone marrow, and this has been also mim uh, mimicked in, in mice. So this may be responsible for the spreading of tumors. The other, the most aggressive subtype, we learn a little bit more on what the tumor is trying to do because, as I alluded before, this is an example of many different mutations in different cases seemingly to obtain the same biological effect. And I spent some time in zooming in this pathway because we studied it extensively, we and others, in, in vitro and also uh, modeled a lot in mice. So imagine this is the cell in the second phase of a germinal center. It's seeing the antigen high affinity. is receiving syndrome from T cells, toll-like receptor, TNF type receptors, uh, very pleiotropic receptor that enforce survival and differentiation. They um, uh, activate a number of pathways downstream, but in common, they all have uh, uh, activation of NF-kappa B transcription factor that moves to the nucleus. So why focus on this? Because if you look at these tumors, over 80%, probably all of them, have nuclear constitutive signal independent NF-kappa B. And if you take away NF-kappa B by shRNA or other strategies or inhibit therapeutically, the cells will die. So they have uh, abnormal activation, signal independent, and are dependent on this, uh, on this alteration to survive. So this seems to be a key factor in their generation of these tumors. However, if you uh, make a mouse in which by different ways, uh, um, okay, may, let me say something more before that. So, and this is a situation we have different genes altered in different cases that justify this NF-kappa B activation. Around 60 to 70 percent of cases we can we have a genetic explanation why NF-kappa B is abnormal in the nucleus. Dominant activation of genes or loss of function of uh, negative regulator of, uh, of NF-kappa B. Now, if you make a mouse, as I said, in which NF-kappa B is constitutive, you'll have a mouse which is full of plasma cells. It will not generate a tumor, per se. It will just uh, fill the peripheral blood of plasma cells. So something else is, different, is needed to make a tumor, and what we see in tumor is something downstream complementing this effect, which is deregulation of BCL6 by all these things that I saw is much more than this, or uh, inactivation of BLIMP1, biolytic loss of function of BLIMP1, which uh, prevents differentiation. And we interpret all this as this uh, alteration enforcing survival, so uh, signal independent survival, cells that should have been, should be died, they don't. And this area downstream providing also tolerance to DNA damage as a mechanism for tumor progression and a block of differentiation. And again, each one, I don't know if I put this line, no? Uh, so we model each one of these in mice and complement them. Each one of them has a the predicted effect. Uh, here the conclusion, I will not show you all the mice. But essentially, we can reproduce diffuse large cell lymphoma by combining this uh, alteration and generating the phenotype. Uh, there are many more, as I indicated, where, that the mice will generate in order to select the tumors, but these uh, are certainly important genetic, uh, genetic alteration. One simple uh, complex slide, but simple concept uh, about therapy. All this, uh, in, in these days, uh, all the biology seems to be targeted to translation, and particularly in cancer, you want to understand what are the pathway altered in order to target. Uh, the point of this slide is simple. Here is again all these pathways that are indicated, and in yellow uh, is uh, to show that we have a lot of drugs, drugs that are approved, that have been patient, that sometimes have been repositioned from other, uh, from other diseases. But the point is the complexity in their use. And one simple example, there is this drug, which is an in inhibitor of this kinase, and it's called ibrutinib, you may have heard, is very successful in some of these diseases. 
And the concept I want to make, it acts on this kinase, which is active in these uh, tumors, and is active in uh, those cases in which the genetic alteration is upstream. But you have to stratify these patients in order to avoid using the drug where the activation is downstream. And this applies to a number of these drugs. You really have to show, to look at the tumors in which the pathway is active, the position of a genetic block of activation. And this is how, you know, the famous concept of precision medicine becomes very, very complicated because if you test, uh, for instance, this drug without knowing the type of tumor, the type of genetic alteration, will have very disappointing results where in some cases when stratify, you will have responses that are biologically understandable. Okay, so one uh, partially new story which will collect, uh, connect to a lot of the biology I described and actually will make the point that uh, studying mutants in tumors, since tumors are, in my view, very smart, identifies a lot of genes that are key for basic biology. This is a concept that comes already from the fact, for instance, that BCL2, a gene that is uh, fundamental probably for the biology of uh, any tissue and for many diseases, have been identified by translocation in tumor, the same as uh, MYC and, and the same as uh, P53. So tumors usually mutate things that are very, very important. And uh, we have been, through the year, particularly uh, paid a lot of attention whenever tumors mute tra mute, uh, mutate transcription factor genes. Why? Because this is the, the, the slide. If you take all the genes that are mutated and coded for transcription factor in lymphoma that are listed here, those are all our mutant genes that we have found through the we and other through the years. They have a very specific regulatory pattern in germinal center. For instance, BCL6, I told you, it turns on in the germinal center, goes away in plasma cells. BLIMP1 is only in plasma cells. MEF2B is turned on early, stays on, and then uh, is responsible also for regulation of BCL6. MIC is very important in the early phase of a germinal center, then it's shut off is briefly re-expressed, allowing recycling of cells through the two phases, and so on. So whenever we have a, a gene, a mutant gene, uh, we are very careful, and we have been able, we and others, to, to uh, construct circuits that are amply validated in vitro and in vivo. For instance, the, the regulatory circuit that connects all this gene at germinal center initiation, and those that they will allow as I told you at the beginning, to allow the cells to go out of the plasma cells. And these circuits at different levels are targeted by mutation in tumors. So we were very uh, uh, excited, to use a big word, when we saw another transcription factor, very famous, FOXO1, probably studied many other biological situations, mutated in tumor. This is the frequency of mutation. I'll tell you what the mutations are in a second. They mutated in the tumors we've been talking about, and also in another one, Burkitt lymphoma. So what is this gene does? So FOXO1, very simplified, is a transcription factor, DNA binding transcription factor, studied from thousands of papers in different tissues. And the key point I stress here is its uh, inverse relationship with PI3 kinase, uh, another fundamental pathway. So uh, FOXO1 stays in the nucleus till it, PI3 kinase and AKT are activated and then it's phosphorylated and this inactivates it, translocate to the cytoplasm and often is degraded. PI3 kinase in the cells we, we are talking about is downstream from many, many uh, signals that are fundamental for the biology of germinal center cells. So inverse relationship between signalings by PI3 kinase and phosphorylation of AKT and activity of FOXO1. So we first studied what uh, FOXO1 does in normal germinal center cells. And we were helped uh, in this by work by Michel Nussensweig lab at uh, Rockefeller, which has identified markers that uh, allow the identification and flow cytometric purification of subset of the two subset of germinal center, so the light zone and the dark zone. So this is a germinal center. And you see different markers. You can identify the two stages that I've been repeatedly mentioning. 
and uh, so remember the two phases. So where is FOXO1 expressed? Is the member of a larger family? Is the only one expressed in germinal center cell? I don't know if uh, light allows you to no look. If you look at the dark zone, the first phase of a germinal center, FOXO1 is there in the nucleus. Whereas if you look at light zone, it essentially is gone. Okay? And if you purify the cells, you see the expected inverse relationship with PI3 kinase signaling. So in the dark zone, the, in both of them there is BCL6, phosphoric KT is barely visible, and there is a lot of FOXO. If you move to the light zone, second phase, AKT is now phosphorylated, PI3 kinase is active, FOXO1 is essentially gone, right? So as expected and validated in the two subsections of the germinal center, which was sort of unexpected. And uh, it took to me a long time to convince the postdoc, let's knock out this gene and see what he does. And rightly so, he told me as being knocked out uh, uh, constitutionally or even in B lymphocyte uh, years ago, when he makes normal germinal center cells, I am not interested in repeating this because it's not going to be published. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, at the first impression, you knock out FOXO1, see this is a germinal center identified by BCL6. Knockout was successful, you have this empty image, there is no FOXO1 in the germinal center. And uh, uh, if you count the germinal center produced, count the B cells with germinal center, everything is apparently normal. And so the uh, investigator years ago did not uh, miss anything, this was the picture. But if now you can identify dark zone and light zone, there is something very, very clear. There is no dark zone. It's a, a light zone only germinal center, which is a strange phenomenon. So this is a normal germinal center, dark zone, light zone, knockout, essentially no dark zone. It's actually, it tries to form and then it cannot make it. And it compensates by filling the germinal center with light zone cells. It's not only the two or three markers, but if you do gene set enrichment analysis, you see that most of the program of dark zone in terms of gene expression is gone, and it's all light zone in terms of, in terms of, uh, in terms of biology. Now, it's not only the B cells that are now this light zone, which is the signal in PI3 kinase, B cell receptor, and all that, but somehow FOXO loss instructs the whole uh, extracellular environment to be light zone. So the light zone has a very specific network on dendritic cells and there they are. You see it's polarized in the normal one. It's only in the light zone. But here is all, all over the place is all dendritic cells around the B cells like you see in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a light zone only. And uh, if you take the textbooks uh, and also my initial scheme, you will say somatic hypermutation, dark zone, class switch recombination, light zone. So we look at what happens. And with our great surprise, the somatic hypermutation works pretty well in number of mutations. This is number of mutation. But something important happens. The, G the B cells are not selected for affinity to the antigen. We can use a specific antigen, and we know which uh, codon mutate in response to the antigen if a cell uh, develops specific antibodies. And we see that in knockout, we have num number of mutation OK, but no selection of those mutant codons. So this mice will make germinal center, will produce antibodies, but they don't produce specific antibody to the antigen. And uh, we interpret that that if you make a light zone right away, there is not a mechanism of selection. The signals will uh, uh, falsely tell the cells uh, it's OK. You have seen the antigen I affinity, even if the selection has not happened. And the reciprocal also, uh, we would expect a normal class switch recombination because we have only light zone. But in fact, there is no class switch recombination in the knockout, uh, despite the fact that the enzyme that uh, uh, you know, is necessary for that is apparently normal AID. This is for the lymph B cell specialist. We, don't, uh, we think, and I have no time to show all the, all the data because I'm going to go back to tumors, but we think that FOXO1 regulates, so this is for the B cell biologist, the sterile transcripts which are necessary for class switch recombination. FOXO induces those, those transcripts, then, it, then it's missing. You have no class switch recombination. Now, uh, how does FOXO 
instruct the dark zone. Now, what is doing this transcription factor? What is the program to make a, a germinal center? And uh, I'll spare you all the technicalities and the characterization of the chief sec experiment. And I go just to what I think is important in the biology. FOXO binds in a statistically significant way to a high percentage of uh, uh, promoter region to which BCL6 also binds. So the overlap is significant. And if you look at where they bind, if you take uh, the major peak of FOXO binding is uh, we need a few hundred base pair from initiation of transcription of many genes. Often they are with BCL6, also binds to some other promoter, a small uh, a minority of promoter without BCL6. BCL6 also binds to the same ones, has also an independent activity as we will see to other pro promoters. They co-bind, but they have different distinct uh, recognition sequences. So the DNA sequence is different, but they often close together there. They don't interact protein-protein, but they can be co-precipitated with DNA on target promoters. And if you, in, in example genes, if you inactivate FOXO, the repressive activity of BCL6 is impaired. So how does this uh, uh, relate in biology? This you see the function of BCL6 repression that I illustrated at the beginning of a talk. And some of them are the one in which FOXO intervenes also. So it modulates BCL6 singly and prevents differentiation here. Co-repressive function on a number of a large number of promoters that they share. Uh, there are a number of functions in which BCL6 is alone without FOXO. And FOXO has its own independent activity in stimulating proliferation via actually activation of transcription. It uh, interacts with co-repressor and co-activator differentially different promoters, so it's responsible for stimulation of, uh, of uh, cell cycle. And this largely justifies the phenotype that we see in conditional knockout uh, mice. Now, what happens to the tumors? Because that's what we're interested in, at least we are interested after the biology. So here again, the mutation, recurrency, different variable depending on group studying and depending on tumors. But if we look at the mutation, then we start understanding the biology. So there is a big cluster on the amino terminal of the molecule. This is where the consensus site from PI3 kinase, AKT mediated phosphorylation occurs that will inactivate the protein. So the prediction is that changing the consensus phosphorylation site will prevent the negative in the inactivation of FOXO1 by PI3 kinase. And then there are other mutations here that are uh, not so clear to interpret. So we focus first on this. And uh, the first example was done in HeLa cells. These are cells that have constitutive PI3 kinase signaling. And in fact, if we look at FOXO in these cells, it, it goes right in the cytoplasm. It's inactive in the cytoplasm. But if you test by transfection several mutants, lymphoma-associated mutants, they, they couldn't care less about VI3 kinase signaling. They mutated the consensus site, and they are constituted in the nucleus. So that justifies, uh, uh, I mean, validates the prediction. So the conclusions, FOXO mutation in a sizable fraction of tumors, they cluster on AKT phosphorylation, they constitutive nuclears, and they are the contribute by enforcing a dark zone phenotype. So there are other mechanisms uh, keeping FOXO in the nucleus that we don't know, but cells are dependent for that, and so therefore it's an important component of the transform phenotype. Okay, this is the collaborators. Essentially, all the FOXO project has been led by David Dominguez Sola, who has recently moved uh, as an assistant professor to Mount Sinai. All the CHIPSEC and bioinformatics by Katia Basso. And this is the genomic group, uh, my long-term associate, Laura Pasqualucci. That's all the sequencing, interpretation, organization of data and the bioinformatic group that allowed us to interpret a large amount of sequencing in the early days, and these are uh, clinical uh, collaborators around different parts of the world. So thank you very much uh, for invitation again and attention. Yes.